Heavenly Father, we once again give you thanks and praise for bringing us all here together safely. Lord, again, we need to hear from heaven today, not me, from you, from thee. My words are useless. Your words are eternal. Please touch every heart within the sound of my voice. Please, Lord, give us something to take with us from this point forward to eternity that we need to chew on starting today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church family. Happy Sabbath. Glad to see my wife and son and our dear visitor here today. I was getting a little worried. I hadn't seen them. Praise God he brought them here safely. Amen. I'm praising God for this new microphone system. You see this? They call it wireless. Now, God has a wireless system of communication also, doesn't he? He calls it prayer, doesn't he? No wires needed, right? No analog, no digitation. The Lord says, just talk to me, and I'll listen. Doesn't he say that? Absolutely. So I'm praising God for another week. The Bible says in Proverbs 18.10, that the name of the Lord, the what of the Lord? The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and is safe, the Bible says. Now that word name is very interesting. In the original Greek, in the original Hebrew, excuse me, we know we often have to go to the original transliteration, the Hebrew, the Greek, or the Aramaic. Jesus spoke the language of Aramaic to get the actual context of what God wants us to know. So that name, that word name actually translates to mean his fame, glory, and reputation. In other words, his character. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. So it's a blessing to be here. We take for granted sometimes that we get to church safe. You know that there are two deaths in this world per second. Did you know that? Two people die on this earth per second. 150,000 people die daily on this earth, and 54.7 million people, 54.7 million people die on this earth each year. So we have to thank the God of heaven that we're able to sit here in his house and hear a word preached from the desk. Amen? We can take nothing for granted in this life. Absolutely nothing. Nothing. I want to read something to you. I'm going to lay a foundation. You don't have to turn here. We have a lot to cover. I'm going to read from Psalm 91. It's a promise, a beautiful promise, the first four verses. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, David says, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him, in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler, and from the noisome pestilence. Does the Bible say in Matthew 24 there's pestilence coming? Pestilence, famines, and earthquakes in diverse places. Amen. Verse 4. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. Trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Do we all need a shield today? I do. Do you? That shield, brothers and sisters, it's Jesus Christ. That shield is Jesus Christ. So again, thankful for God's protection this past week. I'm going to ask you all to please turn with me to the book of John. We're going to read this together. John 15. What I want you all to understand, brothers and sisters, is how much God loves us. We cannot articulate that in, in language. We cannot comprehend it with our, our minute key brains. But it's a love that surpasseth how much understanding the Bible says. How much? All understanding. All. All comprehension. It is impossible to understand that. We just have to take God at his word and say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for dying to death. The wretched death that I deserve to die. Elvin Bridges deserved to die on that tree. For six hours from the third to the ninth hour, the Bible says. Six hours hanging for you and me. Please don't take that for granted. Please do not take that for granted. John 15, we all there? Verse 13, we're going to read verse 13. The Bible says, 
Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Is that a wonderful thing to hear and read? There is no greater love. Now, another great love, I won't say greater, but another great love is that a, we have a father who wants to warn us about the future before it happens. Is that love? To be warned ahead of time, far in advance before something tragic takes place? That's love, too. The Bible says in Isaiah 42, verse 9, one of my favorite verses, Behold, the former things have come to pass. That's history. New things do I declare. That's prophecy. That hasn't happened yet. Then he says through the prophet Isaiah, before they take place, before they spring forth, he says, actually, I tell you of them. In other words, I love you, and I'm warning you before it happens. So you can do what? Prepare. So you can get ready. So we have to study today. The title, as you see, is Sheep or Goat. Sheep or Goat. That's an image of me at a church preaching not long ago in Alabama. Some of you might be familiar with it, but I want to focus on the chat room. Now, a lot of all the churches these days in 2024 have what they call, first of all, a YouTube channel, and they also have a chat room where the home audience can actually participate and go back and forth. I believe it can be somewhat of a detriment because it takes the focus and attention away from the word. People get caught up, very much caught up in the word. I'm going to ask my brother to please tap our sister so she can hear our message this morning. Amen. But I'm going to look at these two points right here. This brother has something very interesting to say. Let's zoom in. The Lord Jesus will return on April 3rd of 2031. In several dreams, Jehovah the Lord showed me. He also showed me that we have until February of 2027. He continues down here. 2027 to get out of the cities. That's very interesting, isn't it? isn't it? Now, the Bible tells us, my Bible tells me, your Bible tells you in Matthew 24, that no man knoweth the day nor the hour of his coming. Is that correct? Only our Father, his Father in heaven knows, right? But in the original, again, we have to go back to the original often to get the proper context. So in the original language now, the Aramaic, because Jesus spoke Aramaic, and Jesus was speaking in Matthew 24, it actually says, no man maketh known. No man make it known. That's a little different, isn't it? So that means God is going to make it known. Jesus has to know when he's coming before he comes. Amen. But no man can say that. So it's foolish, and I would call it sin because it's contrary to what the Bible teaches. No man should be predicting the exact date or year that the Lord is coming. That would be foolish, wouldn't it? But what if, what if, and that's a big question mark. What if this brother is in the neighborhood, even just in the neighborhood? I'm not giving him any credit at all. But what if he's in the neighborhood? Does it behoove us, based on what we're seeing in society today anyway, to maybe take our preparation a little more serious? If, if this brother is in a neighborhood? So where are we right now? Where are we now in prophecy? Now, we're all familiar with this image, right? Daniel chapter 2, the great image that King Nebuchadnezzar dreamt that break him from his sleep. He could not remember the vision or the dream, let alone what it meant. So he called all his astrologers and soothsayers and prognosticators and wizards and everybody else in his kingdom. What did they say? Well, King, you have to at least tell us what you dreamt. That's not fair. How can we tell you what it meant if we don't know what it was that you dreamt? Isn't that what they said? But eventually they called Daniel, and he said, there's a God in heaven that tells and, and uncovers secrets to men and women. So where are we now? We know that the head represents what? Talk, talk to me, church. What does the head represent? Babylon. Babylon. How about the chest and arms? Mid, midsection? Greece? How about the legs of iron? Legs and thighs of iron? Rome. So what's left? The feet. And we know the prophecy tells us in Daniel chapter 2, that there's going to be a stone cut out without hands. In other words, in a miraculous manner, it's going to come down in the days of these kings, the Bible says, while earthly kings are reigning in power and set up his kingdom on earth. Can you say amen? Sister White says, our kingdom is not of this world. 
We are waiting for our Lord from heaven to come to earth to put down all authority and power and set up whose kingdom? His everlasting kingdom. Earthly powers are shaken. We need not and cannot expect union among the nations of the earth. So no matter how hard the nations try to unite and unify together, the Bible says it won't happen. They will not cleave one to another. That's what the Bible says. Our position, whose position, church? Our position in the image of Nebuchadnezzar is represented by the what? The toes in a divided state and of a crumbling material that will not hold together. Europe will never unite. As hard as they try, Europe will never unite. Why? Because the Bible says so. They will not cleave one to another. The prophecy speaks. Prophecy shows us that the great day of God is right upon us. It hasteth greatly. Do you believe it's right upon us? This world is in absolute turmoil. Let me prove it. Deadlier strain of impox or monkeypox spreads to more countries, raising officials alarm. Famine declared in Sudan's Darfur region after months of civil war. And this all happened within a week period, one week period, about a week and a half or two weeks ago. And there's much more I could share with you. U.S. sending aircraft carrier warships and fighter squadrons to Middle East as region braces for Iranian retaliation. Rioters carry out violent, racist attacks across several British cities. What happened and what comes next? See huge crowds gather across the U.K. to block far-right rallies. Nuclear war threat again, brothers and sisters. This world is a mess. But the Bible tells us it's going to get much worse. We haven't even scratched the surface as far as prophecy is concerned. And we're at home dilly-dallying around. And I'm spending the time that we need to with God. The prosecutor versus the felon. This, this election is going to get more attention, more notice than any election this nation has ever had. The key word here is that word up there. What is that word? The fight. The fight for America. You know, publicly, on social media, now this is the truth. Do you want the truth? People are writing on social media that if Kamala wins the election, they're going to go out and start shooting people. Are we living in serious times? They're going to go out and start shooting people. So no matter who wins, we're in trouble. We are in trouble. The only one that can govern us properly is Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? The only one. Though no man knoweth the day nor the hour of his coming, we are instructed, church, and required to know when it is near. Again, laying a foundation before we pray. We are further taught that to disregard his warning and refuse or neglect to know when his advent is near will be as fatal for us, you and me, as it was for those who lived in the days of Noah, not to know when the flood was coming. They were told when the flood was coming. The preacher preached for 120 years. I'm barely half that. 120 years. Every day preaching a sermon. Every knock on that, on that wood or on that ship or that boat with this hammer, Sister White says, was a sermon. But they didn't want the truth. Do you want the truth? Do you want the truth? That's the question this morning. Listen, church. And the parable in the same chapter contrasting the faithful and the unfaithful servant and giving the doom of him who said in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming, that's in Matthew 24, shows in what light Christ will regard and reward those whom he finds watching and teaching his coming, watching himself and teaching and sharing with others who need to know. And those denying it, watch therefore, he says, Jesus says, in Matthew 24, love that chapter, blessed is that servant whom his Lord when he cometh shall find so what? So doing, so doing. So this is the prophetic chart. Where are we now is the question. Where are we now? Well, here's the answer. We're right here. Impending conflict. Trouble is gradually increasing. At some point, things are going to get so bad that the government is going to pass a law we call the National Sunday Law. Slowly, gently, initially encouraging folk to start going back to church. 
They're going to pass a law to do that. But they don't realize, because they don't know prophecy, that those who accept this law and reject the truth about God's holy day, the seventh day of the week, are going to receive the mark of the beast. Why? Because Rome, who actually changed the day from Sabbath to Sunday, says in their own literature that Sunday is their mark of authority. They also say, if you're going to keep the seventh day of the week, the correct Sabbath, God's Sabbath, you might as well become a seventh day Adventist. You've read that. Don't they say that? I was born and raised Catholic. I'm well aware of it. They say that. You might as well be a seventh day Adventist if you're going to keep the seventh day the right day. But brother, sister, trouble is coming. So we have here, we're over here now before the law, 2024. Project 2025 is going to be a big deal. I've covered that in the past. After the law is passed, we have what we call the early time of trouble. Three times of trouble coming on this earth, right? The early time of trouble. <clears throat> the time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time, excuse me, Daniel 12, 1, and then the church. We are going to go through a time that Jeremiah 30, verse 7 calls the time of Jacob's trouble. The time of Jacob's trouble is going to be extremely intense, very bad, but we need to be preparing for that now. So right here you have, again, the early time of trouble here in the middle. This line of separation or demarcation, I like to refer to as Amos 8, verse 12. Amos 8, 12 and Revelation 22, 11 happen right here at that line. And they shall wander from sea to sea, from the north even to the east. They shall walk to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. We don't know how God's going to do it. If he's going gonna to make all Bibles disappear, but the Bible speaks, brothers and sisters, there will be no more word after that point. Also, Revelation 22, 11. Him that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. That's it. Every case is decided and marked in heaven. Every case at this point. So my brothers and sisters, we have to get more serious. Much more serious. Let me read this. I saw regarding that law that's coming. I saw that it is our duty in every case, how many cases? To obey the laws of our land. That's Romans 13, 1 and 2. We all know that. And obey the laws of the nation you live in. Unless, unless they conflict with the higher law, which God spoke with an audible voice from Sinai, and afterward engraved on stone with his own finger. God personalized it. He didn't call the secretary. He personalized it. Can you say amen? Listen. I will put my laws into their mind <clears throat> and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Do you want to be part of that group of people that obey God? I do. Praise the Lord. The light has been given me that tremendous pressures. Have you ever been or had pressure in your life? They're not going to compare to this. Tremendous pressures will be brought upon how many? Does that include all of us? Every Seventh-day Adventist with whom the world can get into close connection. Key word, the world. We need to be 100%, absolutely, totally removed and separated from the world. The world is going to bring a lot of our people down to hell. The world. We have to cut it off. We're going to get into that today. We're studying the sheep and the goats today. It's a very serious subject. Every subject in the word is serious. This, this is extremely serious. The sheep and the goats. Sheep or goat is actually the title. Sheep or goat, question mark. Let's pause and pray, can we? Heavenly Father, we're so thankful again you've gathered us here together. Again, Lord, I don't want to speak anything from me. We want to hear from you today. There's an urgency that I think our people are lacking worldwide, not even just at Venice, but Christians in general. Oftentimes, church is a party. It's a celebration. Brother, brother and sister in front of me, please hear me as I pray to God. Help us to recognize that this is no time for games. We have to get back to old-time, primitive godliness, serious religion, heartfelt, deep religion with asking God 
for forgiveness of our sins and deep repentance. The time has come. Please bless your meeting. Help me, Lord, to formulate my words and thoughts, my memory for your meeting, and I will be careful. We will be careful to give you all the honor, glory, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask you all to turn with me, please, to Matthew 25. We're going to read our scripture reading. And I appreciate Brother Abdi for reading that for us in the opening. Amen. Our young preacher in, in training. Amen. 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 Got to encourage these young brothers. They're, up, they're going to be up against a whole lot. Much more than any of us in our youth ever saw. Ever. Matthew 25. And we're going to start at verse 31. When you all get there, please respond by saying amen. Matthew 31, I'm sorry, Matthew 25 and verse 31. Again, the Bible says, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, how many of the holy angels with him? The Bible says every single angel that was created will be with him when he comes to take us home. All the holy angels with him. Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. 32, Matthew 25, 32. And before him or in front of him shall be gathered all nations. Now that word nations is a very interesting word. Nations. It actually means an assembly, a group of people. It means believers. Listen, church, listen. Listen. And he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. Now, remember, that word nations means something different in other parts of the Bible. Again, that's why we have to go to the original to get the proper context of the word, in this case, Aramaic. But we just learned something in verse 32. The word divideth, that's important, isn't it? It's going to be a great separation at the end. Two camps. Dare I say, two churches. Two churches. 33. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats where? On the left. A huge separation. Mm. 34. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. From the foundation of the world. So two groups, right? Sheep and the goats. The sheep and the goats. Is everybody with me so far? So the sheep. Do you want to be a sheep? I want to be a sheep. First Thessalonians chapter 4, starting at verse 16. Therefore the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ, in Christ, shall rise first. We're talking about sheep. Then we, now Paul used the word we because he believed he'd be alive to see the second coming. That's why he said we. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, in the clouds. Just like the angel said in Acts chapter 1, he will return in how? Like manner as ye have seen him go up into the clouds. That's Bible. We'll be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord where? In the air. He's not going to touch the ground. His feet will not touch the ground. He warned us about that in Matthew 24, didn't he? If they shall say he's in the, sea, the desert, go not or believe it not. If he's in the secret chambers, don't go there. I'm not going to touch the ground. I won't be on earth. I'm going to bring my people, my sheep, up to me. And the Bible says, and so shall they ever be, or we ever be with the Lord, Paul writes. Wherefore, let us comfort one another with these words. That's 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 18. Comfort. Do you want comfort this morning? The only comfort, the only happiness, the only true joy is in Jesus Christ. 100% committed to him and nothing else on this earth. So those are the sheep. Let's go to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation 20. <laughs> Revelation chapter 20, the last book in the Bible, very easy to find. Revelation 20. When you all get there, please respond by saying amen. Revelation chapter 20. <clears throat> Again, the Bible says, I still hear leaves turning. Revelation 20 and verse 1. We all there? Amen. Again, the Bible says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, 
having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in, in his hand. Now, is this a literal gold chain or, or silver chain or, or metal iron that you buy from home people? No. The Bible's talking about a chain of circumstances, a chain of circumstances. Verse 2, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan. We all know that the devil has four names, right? Not including Lucifer. And bound him how long? A thousand years. Three. Revelation 20, verse 3. And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him. You can't go anywhere. You can't leave this earth that he should deceive the nations. The nations, we see that word again. No more. Till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed how long? A little season, a very short period of time. The Bible calls it in Revelation in another place, a short space. A little season and or a short space. So nations in this context, in this verse, mean something a little different. It means in the Old Testament, not worshiping the true God, a pagan or a Gentile. Doesn't this apply correctly in this verse? The nations. He cannot deceive the nations, which he's been doing their entire lives. This is why they're lost. They're asleep on the earth for how long? 1,000 years. Verse 4. So again, those are referring to Satan and the goats. Is everybody with me? The goats. Verse 4. Let's talk about or read about the sheep. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them. And judgment was given unto them. Hmm. You mean they're going to have some authority in heaven? Apparently so. Judgment. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. Pastor Gill talked about that this morning in Sabbath school, didn't he? There's serious persecution taking place in this world, isn't there? Just being a Christian. A church overseas with 100,000 members underground. That's amazing to me. But it's thriving, isn't it? Why? Because they're serving Jesus to the best and highest of their ability. Can you say amen? And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, continuing in verse 4, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither have received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ how long? A thousand years. So if they're living with him, that's one thing. But it says they're reigning. Don't people with authority and, and kingdoms and people of that sort, of that ilk, don't they reign? So it looks like the sheep are going to be with God doing something relating to the judgment. That's what we just read, didn't we? That's what it means. Five, but the rest of the dead, the goats, live not again until the thousand years were finished. Remember, we're talking about two camps, two groups of people that are going to have two endings, two very distinct and specific endings when it's all said and done. This is reality. This is not a fairy tale. This is reality. Skip down for me, please, to verse 7, Revelation 27. And when the thousand years are expired, <clears throat> Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. He's going to be let go, released from his chain of circumstances, bound by circumstances, nobody to tempt for 1,000 years, eight, and shall go out to deceive the nations, all the wicked, all the lost, all the goats. He's going to continue and pick up right where he left off, church, deceiving them, which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. Uh-oh, battle? Doesn't that mean like war? Something that's not a very friendly thing to do to people? That's what the Bible is telling us, to battle. The number of whom is as the what? The sand of the sea. That's key there. Nine. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Two thoughts here on verse 8 and verse 9. The Bible says that they will be the wicked, the goats, as the sand of the sea. And they also went up on the breadth of the sea. That means as far as they could see, those that are inside the holy city, I pray that's you and me, amen, that are inside the holy city, the new Jerusalem, up on the wall, looking out over the wall to see what's going on down there. 
It says the breadth of the earth, as far as they could see from one end of the horizon all the way to the other, all they saw were goats. A whole lot of goats. That tells me, brothers and sisters, that the goats are going to far, far outnumber the sheep. Far outnumber the sheep. It's easy to be lost. It's very difficult to be saved. Why? The Bible says we're in a war. And there was war in heaven. Revelation 12, 7. We're in a war. War is not easy. I'm sure the people here, I know Elder Starks was enlisted back in the day. Serving and being trained to battle in case you have to go battle is not easy. But we are in a war. We're in a battle, a real battle for our eternal lives. There's no way we can win this war or be part of this, this final team unless we surrender everything to Jesus. You're going to see that in our closing hymn today. Amen. I surrender all. I surrender all. So, brothers and sisters, this is, this is the reality. Revelation 20 is speaking to us very loudly. This is the reality of the ending of the final decision for these two groups of people, sheep and goat. It cannot be changed. It cannot be reckoned with. You cannot negotiate with God at this point. It's too late. Far too late. Let's turn to John chapter 10, please. John chapter 10. John chapter 10. Still in the New Testament. We're studying sheep or goat. Sheep or goat. Sheep or goat. Now the Bible... The Bible tells us in many ways, many different ways, and we're all familiar with this, beginning at the top, the saved and the lost. It gives us different points of view and different angles for the same truth, correct? Saved and lost, righteous, wicked, redeemed, damned, justified, condemned, wise and foolish virgins. We're going to talk about them a little bit later. The good and bad fish, the wheat. And the tares, I love that parable, the parable of the wheat and tares. We talked about that a few weeks ago, didn't we? And of course this one, the sheep and the goats. We're going to read about the sheep and the goats now. John 10, we're going to start at verse 1. Are we all there? Amen. John chapter 10 and verse 1. The Bible says, Jesus speaking in red letters, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. There's only one way in, the Bible says. Jesus says, only one way in. No back door entrance. Amen? No back door entrance. Two, but he that entereth in by the door, that's a big clue, is the shepherd of the sheep. Are you following the shepherd today in every way possible? Verse three, to him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. Mm. So I'm seeing here there's a relationship here, isn't there? They hear his voice, and he calls them by their name. Every sheep has an individual name. And he identifies them by that name. So there's a relationship here, isn't there? Verse 4, And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them or ahead of them, He's leading them, and the sheep do what? Follow him, for they know his voice. They recognize it in a sea of people, millions of people, they recognize the shepherd's voice. Real sheep do that too. Real sheep. Five, and a stranger will they not follow, have mercy, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. They don't recognize the voice of strangers. They only recognize, they only should recognize one voice. That's the voice of the king. That's the only voice I want to hear. John 10, 6. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Then said Jesus unto them again, verily, verily. Whenever Jesus says verily, verily, he's saying things might be a little unclear to you. Maybe I'm coming across to you a little fuzzy. Let me clarify for you. In other words, let me make it what? Plain. Let me make it plain. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. Clarification. Verse 8. All, how many church? All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers. 
but the sheep did not hear them. Can you say amen? I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. Ooh. Mm, mm, mm. There is no other door. The only door is Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus says. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, he says. I am, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Listen, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find what? Pasture. Do you want pasture today? Psalm 23 talks about pasture, doesn't it? Do you want to lay beside green pastures? That's what I want. Do you want that? 10. The thief cometh not but for to what? Steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come, Jesus says, I am come that they might have life and they might have it what? More abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. And that's what he did, didn't he? Do you know anyone on this earth that would die for you? That's a hard question. That's a very hard question. I know my mother would die for me. She's 84. That's a very hard question for a lot of us, isn't it? Jesus said, he'll give his life for the sheep. Verse 12, but he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming. This is a powerful verse here. He seeth the wolf coming, the enemy, and leaveth the sheep and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. And now in the real world, wolves, what do they do with sheep? They eat them. They eat them. They devour them. The hireling fleeth, verse 13, because he is an hireling and careth not for the sheep. Do you know what a hireling means? The definition of a hireling? Somebody who does the job for money. That's it. I'll, I'll take the sheep. Just make sure you pay me at the end of the day or the end of the week. They do the job for money only and hireling. 14. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. Again, relationship, brothers and sisters, relationship. 15. As the Father knoweth me, even so I know the Father. And I laid down my life for the sheep. And he did that. 16, very important verse here, prophetic. And other sheep I have, hmm, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall what? Hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. What is Jesus saying here? Back to our chart. He's saying during this time after the passing of the National Sunday Law, which begins what the Bible refers to as the time of trouble. We know it's the early time of trouble. At that point, God's people go out and give the loud cry of the third angel found in Revelation chapter 14. It's right here in the Bible, correct? The loud cry of the third angel. They're giving the world the third angel's messages found in Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 through 12. If you want to include the second coming, it's 6 through 14. Amen. Amen. So they go out worldwide and to typically doing the same work that the disciples did on the day of, after the day of Pentecost. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. Of the disciples, if you read the book of Acts very carefully, they were getting around with, with supernatural powers from heaven, weren't they? They were bouncing from city to city. They were bouncing from coast to coast. God's people are going to be doing the exact same thing. City to city, country to country, continent to continent, supernaturally. Why? Well, we have to compete with the travel arrangements and the things that the devil has developed in this world up to this point. You can go across the ocean now in, what, five, six hours? So God has to supersede that. There's no time to get on a plane. You have to get there, and there's a soul waiting that says, I want the truth. My heart is open and ready. Jesus says, okay, you're there. Witness to the sister. Witness to this brother. You're there. That's what has to be done. This gospel will be closed not by man's way, but a supernatural way. That's what God has to do, supernaturally. So the message is given to the whole world. They come in to the remnant church. Other sheep come in. The Bible says there will be one fold and what? <clears throat> one shepherd. One fold and one shepherd. 
not 85,000 denominations worldwide. <clears throat> no. There has to be one fold before Jesus comes. Everybody has to be in the same camp on the same team, sheep or goats. Sheep or goats. It's as plain as the nose on your face. Sheep or goats. One fold and one shepherd. What I love about this verse that he says, when he breaks it down here, he says, and they shall hear my voice. It's like a summarization of verses 1 through 15. They'll hear my voice. They'll recognize my voice, and they'll come in. Somebody please say amen. Skip down to verse 22 now. John 10, 22. Again, we're studying sheep or goat. John 10, 22. And it was at Jerusalem, the feast of the dedication, and it was what time of year? Don't you love the details that God gives us in the Bible? Don't you love that? He could have just said, and it was Jerusalem at the Feast of a Dedication, period. He gave us the time of year, the season, whole time of year. Amen. 23. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. How many times did they ask him? Over and over and over and over and over and over again. Tap my sister, brother, so she can hear the rest of this message, please. And over and over again. He breaks it down in verse 25. Jesus answered them, I told you, and ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep. Ah, as I said unto you. So what's he actually, by definition, what is he calling the Pharisees? What is he calling them? Goats? Uncle Chuck, praise the Lord. He's calling them goats. Goats. 27. Four points here in this verse. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. First of all, he says, my sheep, that's ownership. You're mine. You've given your heart to me. You've given your life to me. I own you now but not like a slave master, like a loving shepherd. Can you say amen? Like a shepherd. 27 again. They hear his voice. It says they hear my voice. They recognize his voice. He says, and I know them. There's a relationship. And they follow me everywhere I go. What's the consequence or result of that? 28. And I give unto them what? Eternal life. And they shall never perish neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. I just got to say, praise God for that. Praise God. No one can pluck them out of, his, out of his hand. No one. Then he makes a declaration in verse 30. I and my father are what? One. Now look what happens in verse 31. All Jesus did was answer their question. He told them what they asked him to tell them. He broke it down for them in plain English. Well, not English. Plain Aramaic. Amen. Plain Aramaic. And look, look what they proceeded to do after that. Then the Jews took up stones again to what? Stone him. Does the truth do that to people sometimes? Do people reject the truth? Is it human nature to reject plain truth? Does it make something rise up in a person when they get the truth and it, it rebukes them directly? That's human nature. But we have to get over that. If we want to live in heaven eternally through the ceaseless ages of eternity, my brothers and sisters, we have to get way beyond beyond the sensitivity, we're so overly, hyperly sensitive as a people. As a people. Again, I've shared with you in the past how I'm wired. Tell me the truth. I want to go to heaven. Whatever. If Jesus said it, I'm doing it. By his grace, I'm doing it. That's the only way we're going to get there. The only way. So again, other sheep. Other sheep. Let's go to Matthew 25 again. Thank you, soldier. I appreciate that. Matthew 25. One soldier looking out for another. I appreciate that. Amen. Matthew 25. Now, we started off with our scripture reading, 31 through 34, correct? And we learned, brothers and sisters, that there are going to be two groups of people, of human beings, at the end of time. Sheep and goats. We learned that, correct? Now we're going to continue in that chapter, we're going to learn what qualifies a person, what qualifies a person to be a part of each group. What are the qualifiers? Some of the qualifiers. Some of the qualifiers, in other words. Let's pick up at verse 35. Let me read 34 first, just for context. Verse 34. 
Then shall the king say unto them, On his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. 35. Remember, these are qualifiers. For I was in hunger, and ye gave me meat. Meat in the Bible means food. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and what did you do? Took me in. Mm, took me in. A lot of Christians won't do that. A whole lot of Christians won't do that. This is my house. I don't want my walls dirtied up, tub dirtied up. You smell funny. I don't want you eating up all my food. We got to get over that, way over that. Your house, your apartment, whatever you have, your, your double Y, whatever it is, is not yours. Doesn't the Bible say God owns everything? Read Psalm 50, 10 through 12. 36, naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. When you're in prison, having visitation is very important. When I was there, my wife would come visit me. It's very important to see people who still think about you, even though you're locked up, even though you're locked up. I'm not saying this. Jesus is saying it. Jesus is saying it. Listen, church. 37, then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee in hunger and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? 40, and the king, Jesus, the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Does Jesus identify with us? In every single particular, he knows everything we're going through. Never feel like you're alone, ever. He's our Savior, and he loves us. 41, then shall he say also unto them on the left, talking about the goats, right? Sheep on the right, goats on the left. Depart from me. Mm. Mm. Terrible words. Ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Is that everlasting? Does that mean throughout eternity? No. It means for a specified and specific designated period of time. That's a stuff that some, some of us have to really study to understand that. The Bible says in Revelation 20, forever and forever. But in Exodus 20, 21, verse 6, the Bible says forever, meaning in the context of a given period of time, the slave master shall keep his slave forever, but not eternally. Is everybody with me? Listen, for I was in hunger, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you took me not in, naked, and ye clothed me not, sick and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, same as the sheep did, saying, Lord, when saw we thee in hunger, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Of course, the, the sheep said, and did minister unto thee, but the ghost is just the opposite. 45, then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. Mm. Again, Jesus identifies more than we can imagine. 46, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into what? Life eternal. Can you say amen? Do you want to be righteous? We have to know Jesus. Jesus himself said in John 17, 3, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the one true God, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. We have to know him. Not a casual relationship. Well, I'll read my Bible once a month, but I'll look at YouTube videos and, and sermons every day. That'll do it. No, it won't. You have to pick this up, and you have to eat this. Eat, chew, and drink this. This is the word. It's not, it's not God, but it's a reflection of his character. So he needs us to pick this up, this up not once a week, every single day. <clears throat> every day. So we can begin to assimilate the character of Jesus. Assimilate. Can somebody say assimilate? Assimilate. Assimilate. Extremely critical. 
Turn backwards seven verses, brothers and sisters, to Matthew 18. Matthew 18. Again, we're studying sheep or goat. Sheep or goat. Sheep or goat. Matthew 18. We're going to start at verse 12. Matthew 18, 12. Listen to how much Jesus loves us. Just listen. How think ye, if a man have how many sheep? And hundred sheep. And one, how many? And one of them be gone astray. One. Doth he not leave the ninety and nine and goeth into where? The mountains? And seeketh that which has gone astray? Is that love? The mountains? The ninety and nine, they're, they're okay. They're, I'm not concerned about them. They're, they're secure. They're tight. But this one is wandering and going astray. Is anybody here wandering and going astray this morning? Jesus says, I'm going to come get you. I don't care where you are. I'm going to come and get you, find you and bring you back into my fold. That's what Jesus is saying. 13, and if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Mm. He loves pulling people, pulling Christians out of the clutches of the devil. He loves to do that. Jesus, didn't we just read that? He loves to do that. 14, even so it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Not one. He wants to save us all, brothers and sisters. There's approximately almost nearly 8 billion people on this planet right now. 8 billion. According to what we just read, he wants to save all 8 billion he desires and yearns to have 8 billion sheep in heaven. That's what he wants. But biblically, that's not going to happen, is it? That's not going to happen. So we have to ensure that we are on his right side, his right hand, when the dividing takes place. The separation we read about in Matthew 24, 25, excuse me, Matthew 25. We have to be on the right side of the fence. The save side, the sheep. Can somebody in this church say amen? amen? The sheep, the sheep. Speaking of sheep, fun facts about sheep. Sheep have an amazing memory and can remember other people and sheep. Do you know that the proper diet will help you to do that? The Bible says that in Isaiah 7. Verse 15, talking about Emmanuel. Emmanuel is brought to view in verse 14. Verse 15 says, butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. And, and choose the good. Excuse me, I'm thinking about food, right? <laughs> refuse the evil and choose the good. So the Bible is saying what we eat has a definite effect on our ability to make proper heaven-approved heaven decisions Choose the good and refuse the evil based on what he, Emmanuel, God with us, ate when he was on this earth. That's what the Bible's telling us through the prophet Isaiah. Interesting that it, that is an identifier about sheep. A ewe can recognize the bleat of her lamb. Sheep can see behind them without moving their head. Isn't that interesting? Their pupils are very wide and they're almost rectangular. Imagine trying to sneak up on a sheep and he knows you're there before you even realize he realizes you're there. That's very interesting. Sheep can, I just read that. What do sheep have in common with breastfeeding mothers? Lanolin. That's interesting too. Sheep self-medicate eating certain plants when they're ill. They're, they're health reformers, aren't they? Isn't that what it says? They're health reformers. This is almost prophetic. Goat. Goats are domesticated animals which are tamed by human beings for various needs. There are more than 300 breeds of goats or goat that are known to human beings. That's a lot. A goat has a lifespan of 15 to 18 years, depending on the climatic conditions and how well it is domesticated. The male goat is called a buck, while a female goat is known as a doe. Goat farming is a billion-dollar industry around the world. Let's read. Sheep follow the voice of their shepherd. 
and trust him to lead them to food, water, and safety. If they wander, which some do, in the spiritual world, that's applied too also, correct? Remember the 90 and 9, the 90 and 9. If they wander, which some do, the shepherd will go out and rescue them and bring them back to the safety of the flock. I love the spiritual application. I found this online. Sheep separated from their shepherd and flock are nervous and vulnerable. Isn't that the truth? Because they have no defensive or offensive survival abilities. Mm. They need their shepherd. They need their shepherd. Do you see that? A goat, however, flip side, doesn't follow anyone. A herd of goats goes where it wants, and the goat herd follows behind. Instead of grazing, goats browse, foraging for whatever strikes their fancy. It sounds like human beings in a lot of ways, doesn't it? Church show got quiet. So that tells us that if we are allowing ourselves to be led, being sensitive to the pull of God's spirit and following the path of our shepherd, we are what? Sheep. Sheep. If we are headstrong, going our own way and pulling back against God's spirit, we are what? Goats. We're goats. So remember, all these terms the Bible is using is talking about the same thing, the saved and the lost. We're going to look at the wise and foolish versions just for a minute. I want you to really take a look at this picture. I want you to really take a few seconds and look at this picture. It speaks volumes. This is the parable of the wise and foolish virgins in Matthew 25. <clears throat> if you look at their faces, brothers and sisters, they all look alike, very similar. They're all dressed alike. They're all carrying lanterns. But there's a problem, isn't there? These over here are smiling. Are these over here smiling? No, they're not. No, they're not. These over here, their lanterns are lit. These over here are having a little trouble trying to get their lanterns lit. This sister right here is about to reach out to this sister and say, I'm, I'm out of oil. Can I have some of your oil? This sister is putting her hand out, isn't she? I don't have any more oil. I can't share my oil with you. Oil represents the Holy Spirit. My character has been developed by the, the aid of the Holy Spirit. How can I share my experience with you? That is biblically impossible to do. I can't do that. So you have to go to them that buy to try to get some more oil. But brother, sister, there is no more oil. At this point in, in prophetic history, in the prophetic timeline, there is no more oil. Sheep and goats. How long? Forever. Forever. Listen, please. In the parable, all the ten virgins went out to meet the bridegroom. How many? All ten. They all thought that they were ready. We have wise and foolish virgins in this church. We have sheep and goats in this church. Is that the reality? What have we been studying? Sheep and goats. The goal is for us all to be sheep. But right now, on this day, on this Sabbath, everybody in here is split. There's a divide. But I don't know what that divide is. Only God sees the heart, right? We learned that from our study of the parable of the wheat and tear. We can't identify a wheat or a tear. Neither a sheep or a goat. All had lamps and vessels for oil. For a time, there was seen no difference between them. They looked exactly the same, spiritually. Spiritually. So with the church that lives just before Christ's second coming, the true church, the last church, all have a knowledge of the scriptures, all have heard the message of Christ's near approach, and confidently, maybe some arrogantly, expect his appearing. But, it, but as in the parable, so it is when? Now, today. A time of waiting intervenes, faith is tried, and when the cry is heard, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Many are what? Unready. Lord, help us. Help us. They have no oil in their vessels with their lamps. They are destitute of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says all we have to do is ask for the Holy Spirit, and he'll come. Just ask. We have to just ask for him. He's waiting. What are we waiting for? While they went to buy, the procession moved on and left them behind. Mm. The five with lighted lamps joined the throng and entered the house with the bridal train, and the door was shut. Eternity. 
the New Jerusalem, when the foolish virgins reached the banqueting hall, please get this, they received an unexpected denial. They really believed, brothers and sisters, they were ready. They expected to go in. The master of the feast declared, I know you not. They were left standing without or outside in the empty street in the blackness of the night. What a description, in the blackness of the night. Is this earth going to be dark and void without form, just like it was in the beginning during the 1,000 years? Yes, it is. You go to Matthew 20, I'm sorry, Revelation 20. You compare that with Jeremiah 4, Isaiah 24, and you've all done that study. You know. And the Bible breaks it down very easily for us. The world's going to be in the exact form that it was in the beginning. In the beginning, Genesis 1. The blackness of night. Listen. But five have neglected to fill their flasks with oil. They did not anticipate so long a delay. Oh, I got 20 more years, 30 years. I'm going to enjoy life. I'll worry about that when I get old or older. Is that a wise thing to do? No, brothers and sisters, that is extremely unwise to do. Tomorrow's not guaranteed. What did I quote you in the opening? About how many people die per minute, per week, per month, per year, whatever it is. Millions of people. Tonight's not promised. Tonight is not promised. Listen, in distress, they appeal to their wiser companions saying, give us of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the waiting five, with their freshly trimmed lamps, have emptied their flagons. There's nothing left. They have no oil to spare, and they answer, not so. Lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. But brothers and sisters, the store is going to be closed. It's going to be closed. Without the Spirit of God, a knowledge of his word is of no avail. Mm. The theory of truth unaccompanied by the Holy Spirit, cannot quicken the soul or sanctify the heart. One may be familiar with the commands and promises of the Bible. I know at Venice, I know this Bible from Genesis 1-1 all the way to Revelation 22-21, back and forth, memorize large chunks of Scripture. I was at a church once, me and my wife, a few years ago. This brother, and this brother is very well known. You probably all know him. This brother, this brother recited the whole chapter of Revelation 15. The whole chapter, right in front of the whole church, without the Bible. But what does this say? One may be familiar with the commands and promises of the Bible, but unless the Spirit of God sets the truth home, the character will not be what? Transforms. We're talking about a change. A change. Without the enlightenment of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, men will not be able to distinguish truth from error. Oh, oh, can you imagine that? And they will fall under the masterful, masterful temptations of Satan. To not be able to distinguish truth from error, right from wrong, evil from righteousness. That is an extremely serious thing to me, and it should be to you too. That is real, real, real serious. The class represented by the foolish virgins are not hypocrites, okay? They have a regard for the truth. They believe it. They believe it. They have advocated the truth. After church, they're going out there and grabbing tracks and passing them out. Every week, they're advocating, they're sharing, they're proclamating. They are attracted to those who believe the truth. They're at camp meetings all over the country every summer. But they have not yielded themselves to the Holy Spirit's working. This is talking to somebody in this church this morning. Somebody. They have not fallen upon the rock Christ Jesus and permitted their old nature to be broken up. We know people who have been in this message 50, 60 years, and there's no change. I don't judge anybody. I just call it how I see it. Same rotten character. 50, 60 years. Know this Bible back and forth. Spirit of prophecy back and forth. But we're talking about assimilating the character of Jesus. The lovely, the lovely Jesus. Can you say amen? The lovely Jesus. That's what he wants. He wants a loveliness of character in us. Like my brother, Pastor Gil, said this morning, Jesus living in and through us, that's the only way that can happen. They have not fallen upon the rock Christ Jesus and permitted their old nature to be broken up. That's the problem. This class are represented also by the stony ground hearers, Matthew 13. 
They received the word with readiness. The Bible says anon, A-N-O-N, but, but they fail of assimilating its principles. That's the problem. That's the issue. Don't just read, absorb. Lord, help me to absorb what your Bible's saying. This is not a novel or Sports Illustrated or Reader's Digest or, or TV Guide. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Its influence is not abiding. The Spirit works upon man's heart according to his desire and consent in planting in him what? A new nature, a new creature. Consent. Lord, I give you permission. Come in, please, and take over. I'm rotten. The prophecy says that we are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Revelation 3. That's what it says. That's our condition prophetically. But Jesus says, I can change that. I can change that. Just let me in. But the class represented by the foolish virgins, my brothers and sisters, have been content with a superficial work. They do not know God. They think they know God. They think they know God, but they don't know him. And there's a class of saints in the church that are just like that. Why? We're reading it right here. They think they know God. Brother, sister, this is real serious stuff. Those who hide their light will soon lose all power to shine. This is a great lesson here. Please pay attention. They are represented by the foolish virgins. And when the crisis comes, which we know is just ahead, and the last call is made, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him, they will find that what? While they have been mingling with the world, their light has gone out. Did you get the lesson? So you're a foolish virgin. You're a part of that group in Matthew 25. We just learned that the number one issue in your light going out and running out of oil and your lamp going dim and dark is worldliness. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For the lust of the flesh and lust of the eyes and the pride of life are not of the Father, but are of who? The world. The world. The devil. And the devil's taking a whole lot of goats with him, a lot of goats. So we have to prize this, brothers and sisters, and cherish this light and information that we got. Worldliness makes our lamps go dim. Worldliness. Look at this here. Character is not transferable. Isn't that? That's the, that's the lesson. That's the lesson of Matthew 25. Therefore, ease-loving, world-loving professed Christians cannot go in with the wise virgins to the marriage. They have not studied his character. They have not held communion with him. Is that important? Oh, oh, oh. They do not know how to trust, how to look and live. Their service to God degenerates into what? A form. A form. Again, the wise and foolish. So we just read, we need what? We have not communed with him. Is communion important? An intimate conversation with God. Nobody else around. Let's go to Exodus before we close. Exodus 25. Exodus 25. This is, again, one of my favorite passages in the Bible. Exodus 25. Exodus chapter 25. When you all get there, please respond by saying amen. amen. So we need an experience, brothers and sisters, that we don't possess right now. And I'm including myself at the top of the list. Exodus 25. We are there, amen? Verse 8. But first, we're going to see who's speaking in verse 1. Let's get context. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, so that establishes the fact that God is speaking to Moses. Amen? Verse 1. Skip down to verse 8. And let them make me a what? A sanctuary that I may do what? Dwell among them. God with us. He wants to be with us all the time. Did I just read that? But you have to build me something, something that's holy, a dwelling that I can come in without destroying you with my brightness and my holiness and perfection. So build that, and I'll come spend time with you. Let's prove that. Go to verse 22. Let's prove that. He told Moses in verse 22, I love this verse. God is speaking. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony, of how many things? All things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. All things. This is a spirit being 
the creator of everything, that's telling a wretched, sinner, sinful human being, I will meet you and commune with you. That's how much, I, how much I love you. I will condescend, and I will talk to you face to face. Brothers and sisters, do we comprehend this? Face to face. Face to face, one on one. So we have to get real today, brothers and sisters. God is speaking to us. We all, everybody in this church and this congregation needs Jesus. We need Jesus today. And we have to stop being so, so proud, proud. We have members in this church that won't even come into the sanctuary if certain speakers are speaking. Can we be real today? Can we be honest today? Sabbath school wins, they get up and walk out. Some of them won't even come into the church at all when certain speakers are here. Do you think that God is smiling on that? If you do, you are deceived. God is not with that. God is not with this. This is very, 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 I'll say very, very again, serious business. We're talking about salvation. You won't enter the house of God because you don't like somebody? And you call yourself a, Christ, a Seventh-day Adventist Christian? Again, can, can we be real today? So I, I plead with God for my brothers, and I plead with God for my sisters. You haven't noticed when certain individuals are up here, the church is a little emptier? You haven't noticed that? You can all see. So God says, listen, you need to eliminate self, self-pride, self-righteousness. Come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. Take my yoke, he says, my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my burden is easy, and my yoke is what? Light, light. Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30. So we can't sugarcoat, brothers and sisters. We have to cry aloud and spare not. Our brothers and sisters are in grave danger. They're in grave danger. And I know they're going to watch this because they watch everything we do up here, but they won't come in and watch. They're in grave danger. They're offending the God of heaven and earth, of Israel, of Isaac and Jacob. So we have to pray today, and we have to ask God, Lord, if there's anything in me that is not in harmony with your will for me, please take it away. Help me to overcome whatever it is. Sin comes in so many forms, so many forms. So we have to talk to God. I mean, seriously, 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 seriously commune and pray and talk to God today. We see clearly from the prophecy chart that we are almost at the end. Almost. Look at this image. What is this an image of? An artist's depiction. Jesus entering, Jesus in heaven, welcoming the saints into heaven. I got news for you. I got news for you. Every one of those people that are going to the holy city, the new Jerusalem, which is brought to view in Revelation 20, they're all sheep. Every one of them is a sheep. There'll be not one goat in heaven. Remember, the ten virgins we just read, they all look alike. They all look the same. God says, no, I see, I see what I see. I see sheep and goats. That's what I see, and it's going to be a great separation, according to our scripture reading, a great separation at the end. We want to ensure we're on the right side. Can somebody please say amen? Anybody in need of prayer, please, I'm asking. My appeal is simple. Please come forward. I want to pray with you. And I'm going to ask Elder Starks. I'm going to ask... Pastor Lavoy to come forward. I'm going to ask Elder Chuck to come forward. And I'm going to ask our honorary elder, Elder Lovejoy, to please come forward too. We need to all pray for the church. And we need to pray for each other. I mean, serious prayer. We've reached a time where we have to seriously weep between the porch and the altar. Do you all agree with that? I mean, serious prayer. I'm going to get a microphone. Do we have a cordless mic? Thank you, brother. Elder? Okay. I'm going to ask each prayer to be brief in the interest of time, and I'll finish off. I'm going to start over here to my left, Pastor Lavoie. And I'm going to ask us all if we're able, if we're able to kneel, and then I'll finish off. Our loving Father, we thank you for being here today with us. 
We know that your Holy Spirit has been here speaking through our brother. We want to respond by saying, Lord, I want to give my heart totally to you, surrender yes. all, yes, and to give up though anything. There's no in-between that you can go. So, Lord, help us to be surrendered completely to to you, our yes. shepherd, we pray. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen, Father. Father in heaven, we are grateful, Father, for your great love for each and every one of us here. Yes. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, for speaking to us uh, this afternoon. Mm. You know the material that you are working with in our hearts. Yes. And so, Father, we are asking, Lord, that you would do that Ezekiel asked. Give us a clean heart and a right spirit, Lord, that we can all be instruments in your hands to be those sheep you want to enter into your kingdom. And so, Lord, we thank you, Father, for your great love and mercy towards us and speaking to our hearts this afternoon. And, Lord, we know that you are able to Finish the work you've started in each and every one of us. And we give you the honor and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Father, thank you so much for reminding us of your unceasing love for each one of us. That, that you would go to the ends of the universe. Amen. You would take Amen. your spotless <coughs> son... And offer him on a on a dirty, ugly cross for for just one of us. You would have done that. Yes, right. Mind-boggling. We we can't tell you how much uh, we love you for that. We want to demonstrate that today. I I pray that your spirit would come in and just clean our hearts, clean our thoughts, clean our minds, and make us the church that you want us to be, the yes. people that you want, the sheep yes. mm -hmm. in that fold. <coughs> I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Go ahead. Give us a few words. Go ahead. Our Heavenly Father, we want to declare ourselves again just like Jesus did. The time in our life is now. We openly give to our, our hearts that we want to be members of that royal kingdom. And the Heavenly Father bless us to that end. We pray for the unity of our church. And we pray for yes. each other that our hearts can be softened and wooed by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Amen. Amen. Closing off, dear Lord, I just want to echo what all my brethren pre uh, prayed just now, particularly Elder Lovejoy. We need to pray for unity. You know, Lord, you see everything. Nothing escapes your eternal gaze. This church is not unified. It is split. So we pray, Lord, that you would please condescend. Send your Holy Spirit here. here. There's no, re no reason to sugarcoat anything, Lord. You know what's taking place here. Please send your spirit of love, of unity, of unconditional, non-compromised love of total surrender to you. This is the only way we'll ever see a 100% unified body, a body. Please, Lord, hear and answer our prayer according to your will. Again, we love and ask and thank you in being part of this service and speaking to all of us, firstly and chiefly me today. We love and thank you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 Oh, sacred.